Hi everyone, this week we are going to go over the future of globalization. We spent eight or nine weeks talking about where globalization is coming from, the different steps in the um, world economy history that led to the globalized world as we know it today. And um, now I'm going to go over what's next. What can we expect about the future of globalization? In particular, I will talk about when the second unbundling is going to stop and if somebody else is going to um, succeed it. The usual disclaimer, this course content is partly taken, if not fully, from SFU professor Nicolas Schmidt's notes. However, I am entirely responsible for any error and I do not legally allow this content to be published without my consent. So, spoiler alert, after a second unbundling, we might expect to see some sort of a third unbundling. LIVC sees the end of the second unbundling as a return to more bundling, where production goes back closer to consumption. You can think about uh, Trump times, where uh, when he was in power, um, not the case anymore. But we will see that uh, this is not clear as whether production is going to go back closer to consumption or not. Especially now Biden is up, they might be uh, more. Um, there might be the end of trade wars and other things like that. So I'm going to go over three different forces that um, are going to um, be active from that one. We have forces that may deepen or slow down the second bundling. We're going to have, I'm going to talk about the third and bundling. In particular, this relates to lower face to face costs. And third, I'll talk about the robotization or compufacturing of industries. That will be a shorter um, force to talk about. We also have a possible new industrial revolution affecting the future of jobs. So that will be the topic of the next lecture in particular, the future of work. And the robotization is likely to have large impacts on international trade and on economic policies in developed and emerging countries. So, in this first force, forces that may deepen or slow down the second bundling, I will distinguish five sub-forces that may either deepen or slow down the second unbundling. ICT costs. So going back to Metcalfe's, Moore's and Gilder's law. Transportation costs, that is more related to the first unbundling, but we're going to look at how uh, their evolution now is going to deepen or slow down the second unbundling. Barriers to trade. Issues related to production. And if there are issues related to production, we are going to go over issues related to consumption or to demand. ICT costs first. So remember Moore's, Gilder's and Metcalf's laws about uh, the acceleration, about the speed of progress of information and communication technologies. Those laws point to continued reduction in the cost of collecting, managing and transmitting data. Every year now, you have new super powerful processors that come out and are made available to consumers like us among other things. Bandwidth, networks, we went from 2G to 3G in a certain number of years, but then 3G to 4G in uh, a shorter period of time and 4G to 5G in an even shorter period of time. So with communication costs down, fragmenting and offshoring are likely to continue. It's going to be even easier to coordinate activities all over the world. But lower IT costs also imply more computing power, which also implies more automation, more robots, and maybe less need to, re to rely on cheap labor. 
So there might be less offshoring because you don't need to go to another country to get cheap labor. You don't need labor anymore, maybe, or not as much. And so there might be more onshoring. So the production might go back to uh, the country that is where the firm is located. So we have two different forces that act in opposite direction. Transportation costs now. Nowadays, oil is a significant part of transportation and will continue to be so. Oil prices are very uncertain and volatile. That makes fragmentation of production uncertain. In the 1990s, when the first, when the second and bundling um, started, we were in a period of falling oil prices, following the um, oil shocks from 74-75 and 79-80. But oil prices hindered the second bundling after the year uh, 2000, where prices started increasing again. However, despite rising oil prices, second, the second unbundling has been um, progressing even further. Here is a graph I found online with uh, the evolution of oil prices over time. So I believe that this is the price for a uh, gallon of oil. You can see that from uh, the 1990s here with the peak, that's probably around uh, the second oil shock. Oh, I'm not sure actually. It's been steadily decreasing over 10 years until the year 2000. And then it's been steadily increasing. Of course, we have high fluctuations in the middle, high volatility in oil prices. But since 2000, oil prices have been staying relatively high until they decreased again in 2020. Guess why? Well, well, a lower demand for gasoline due to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you want to see more about uh, the trend of other prices, you can check this website. The link is right there. Oh, barrel, gallon, sorry, sorry, it's a barrel, yes. I never know uh, units of uh, volume in the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right, right, right. Not a gallon, a barrel. Then the third force is a force related to the first unbundling where we talked about not only lower transportation costs, but also more liberalization of trade with lower tariffs, uh, less protectionism. We talked about destructionism until world wars and after World Wars? Well, in 2008, we had a financial crisis, which has not led to protectionism despite similarities with the Great Depression era. The crisis was mostly financial though, so in terms of trade, patterns were overall um, maintained. The cost of producing a good um, maybe decreased, but relatively to maybe other countries or maybe relatively to producing those goods um, with other firms or other countries, there was not that much of a change. Barriers to trade have started to increase over the recent months. So uh, that will be more before the pandemic, something around two, uh, 2018, 2019. You can imagine that Donald Trump um, played a role in um, played a role in this uh, increase in barriers to trade. So you can look at um, the left graph shows a world exports um, using two different base years, but world exports have been um, decreasing um, um, lately. And the right graph shows the quarter on quarter growth of world imports of goods and services. So up until 2008, imports were um, relatively steady. So 
So world trade climbed back to pre-financial crisis levels after a few years without widespread protectionist policies. Usually when there is a crisis, an economic crisis, countries tend to close on themselves to, you know, regroup kind of because they are, well, a crisis exposes them to risk. Um, Many countries, if they are weakened by a crisis, might uh, fear the risk of, you know, of this crisis lingering. So they might limit trade with other countries. They might try to limit sharing aggregate risks. If countries depend on other countries for uh, the production of certain goods, then an exposure to aggregate risk is going to be a um, very detrimental to the country. Remember, I talked about um, the pandemic. I talked about the production of masks and sanitizing equipment, in particular for France, who was not producing many of them in the first place. They tried to import them from China, but since every country needed masks, they didn't manage to get a deal. They didn't manage to um, pretty much um, be the highest bidder. And the French government delay its um, provision of masks to the population. So one of the um, one of the measures as a consequence was massive lockdown. In fact, France is still in a process of a lockdown with very early curfews, 6 p.m. every day. It's pretty early for a curfew, which I believe has been maybe pushed back to 7 p.m. or maybe as of next week. I'm not sure. But um, the pandemic is uh, doing ravages um, in France. We can count something around 20,000 new cases every day for a population of 70 million people. So that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. There is a lot of uncertainty today about the future of the international trade environment and, yeah, in particular, the share of aggregate risks. So those numbers are from the 2008 financial crisis. Maybe in one year or two, we will look at um, we will look at the uh, recent figures um, using the um, around the pandemic just to see if numbers got better over time. We are still in the middle of it. So I figured I would not get um, updated data. You can see here 2007, 2008. Uh, actually, here, 2008 Q3 is September, is the fall of Lehman Brothers. So it's kind of officially the beginning of uh, the financial crisis. And there is a um, massive decrease in quarter on quarter growth in exports and imports. In fact, it becomes uh, heavily uh, negative. So, which means that exports and imports decreased a lot starting in the third quarter of um, 2008 and if you look at the same graph but by product category rather than um, by country where they pretty much all follow the same trend it is the same for um, all categories of goods although uh, the trends are a bit different if you look at minerals and oil for instance there was a massive increase in um, exports and imports Um, of mineral and oil and as a consequence of the crisis actually it decreased by way more than all the other goods so still talking about protectionism and trade maybe that slide might be a bit outdated but what will the current trade war between the US and China do to supply chains So there was more of a trade war when Trump was in power, in particular with his uh, communication strategy where he would, well, you know, Trump, he would trash talk a lot and some countries would not um, take it as a joke, would not, uh, would take it rather seriously, rather, and uh, would lead to a trade war. Will it make firms stay in China because they have invested there? Will it induce firms to shift back production in the U.S. to avoid uh, to avoid dealing with tariffs? Or maybe it will make them shift production to other countries where still uh, labor is cheap, like Vietnam, Cambodia, 
to avoid tariffs, particularly coming from China. Um, quickly, going back to the 2008 crisis, I see in the chat that people are talking about The Big Short. Great movie. I've watched it many, many times. I love the actors. I love Christian Bale, among others. Uh, but the movie is great. It gives you a rough idea of what exactly happened in 2008. It doesn't get into the very intricate details of um, how um, it created a snowball effect. Although, rather quickly, when they talk about derivatives, which are side bets. So in particular, in the movie, there is a scene with Selena Gomez, which is at the casino table. And um, she is talking about having a good winning streak. And she says, I have a good winning streak. I'm going to keep betting. And then Richard Thaler, which is a um, experimental economist, I believe, or experimental psychologist, uh, very famous, talks about the gambler's um, fallacy. Um, let me talk about this now quickly because it's a interesting um, phenomenon. Let's say you flip a coin 10 times in a row, fair coin. And the 10 times you get heads. Pretty nice. What is the probability that the 11th time you're going to get heads again? Any answer in the chat? So I see very low, but I also see one out of two. So the answer is one out of two, because each throw is independent of the other. Whenever you reset, again, your coin is fair, so you will, um, so you will have a 50% 50, 50 chance. The fact that you got 10 heads in a row before happened with a low probability, but the probability was not zero. You could call this lucky if heads was a win for you, or you could, this, you could call this unlucky if heads was a loss for you. It is the same thing when you play poker. If you feel like you've been on a winning streak because you've, you've won a couple hands, uh, you've won hands a couple times in a row, every time the cards are reshuffled, either by a machine or by a dealer who knows how to shuffle them in a pretty, uh, pretty good way. So every time cards are reshuffled, in principle, it resets all of the probability of you winning, whether you have a good hand or not. So many people, especially at the casino, who play you know, on the gambling machines, feel, oh, this machine is hot, like it's, it's making me win. Well, the machines are not, each uh, draw is independent of the previous draw. So the fact that you got a couple good draws in a row is a result of luck. It's not a result of, I have the fluid, or, um, <laughs> or this machine right now is doing something good for me, or, you know, whatever. Or God is helping me. It's just an outcome that we thought was not very likely, but that happened. The probability of this outcome happening was not zero, like winning at the Lotto. The probability is extremely small, yet, you have winners every now and then. It would be nice to be the winner. You could call this the law of large numbers, but it's not exactly what it is. The gambler's fallacy is about this belief that you're going to win in the next one. The law of large numbers is about repeating an experiment, a random experiment many, many times and converging to the true probability of this experiment's um, outcome. It's a bit different, okay. Uh, but yeah, The Big Short is a good, is a very good uh, movie to talk about roughly um, how things unfold back then. And of course, how will all of this change with the new president, Joe Biden? Joe Biden is way more pacifist when it comes to uh, doing trade with other countries. So chances are that he's going to reestablish friendly diplomatic relationships with the rest of the world, in particular with China, to facilitate trade. But, I don't know, um, I haven't heard much from Joe Biden yet. I mean, it also makes sense. Trump was so vocal and was so on the social media platforms all the time, way more than all the previous presidents, that now it feels very weird when a president doesn't talk for a week, which in fact is more like the normal uh, the usual uh, way presidents um, communicate. 
Before I move on, is the gambler's fallacy testable? Um, you should be able to test that in a lab by making, uh, by making subjects play a certain game, like a random game. It could be a, a flip a coin. And maybe what you can do is give, um, instead of giving them the outcome of the, of, the, um, of the coin toss, you give them an outcome that you want. So to some of them, you're going to give them a bunch of heads. To some of them, a bunch of tails. To some of them, maybe 50-50. And after 10, 20 throws, maybe you can ask, what do you believe the probability of the next heads is? Then you can look at the reported beliefs based on the previous outcome. And maybe you can draw a graph on, um, you know, there are the ones who believe it's 50-50, no matter what happened before. So the ones, those are the ones who are not subject to the gambler's fallacy. But then some of them will believe that the probability is different, like 60% or 30% or 90%, given what happened before. And then you could see how their belief changes through after through. You could ask their belief every, um, at every iteration and maybe see if their beliefs are actually going to change, although it's a coin toss. That could be a way to test that. I'm not sure, but I have a couple of friends here who work in the lab and try to do experiments about these kind of things. Gambler's fallacy could be a, a new subject for a paper. Something you, could, uh, something you could suggest if you take any experimental class, experimental economics class, which is, I believe, at the 300 level. Now, the last two forces are related to production and to consumption or demand. Regarding production, we have climate change or more generally natural disasters. So increasing risks of natural disasters perturbing the supply chain coordination can, be, uh, can deepen or slow down the second unbundling. Think about Fukushima disaster closing General Motors plants in the United States or the coronavirus, they are not exactly related to climate change, but I think you get my point. They are both natural disasters, stopping or delaying production. Smaller differences in wages around the world. The fact that uh, wages overall are homogenizing, oh, it's a hard one to say, or getting more and more homogeneous makes it less um, makes it less profitable to get some stages of production done in other countries rather than just um, onshoring them. You still have to pay for transportation cost, but if the difference in wages is not that big, you might as well um, onshore some of your production. In particular, China wages increase making production in China less interesting than it used to be. In fact, I believe in China now, 300 million or maybe now 500 million um, of Chinese people live exactly the way we live in terms of income per capita and so on. And the same will be happening in other parts of the world. In fact, many international trade models are uh, predicting the uh, equalization of factor prices. If one country has a comparative advantage in, uh, let's say, uh, labor, like they are endowed with low-skilled labor, so they can produce goods that need low-skilled labor, eventually low-skilled labor will then get in demand, their wages are going to increase, and eventually they are going to um, converge towards wages from um, other countries. That's usually what models predict. They don't predict this over uh, decades, years, or centuries, because some models are static. It's just a prediction that eventually this is going to happen. Then when it comes to quantifying this convergence, it is very different. Many growth um, theory models are predicting um, countries to uh, converge in terms of income per capita, yet we still haven't seen a lot of convergence for many countries. So in theory, we should see some convergence. In practice, there are many more factors that models don't take into account.
It's true. 600 million Chinese people still live with less than 200 Canadian dollars a month. I mean, I didn't know about this figure, but it's true that uh, there are two Chinas. It's true that uh, in deep rural China, they are still barely have any cars. It's, it's really a thing. Uh, but if you go towards the coast, where all the big uh, financial centers are now, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, um, Almen, and so on, yes, this is where the um, population with the same standards of living as us live. The rest of China is definitely neglected. Same with the Indias and Americas, I totally agree. What about robots? Cheaper and more efficient robots make the location of production less determined by supply consideration. The first robots were expensive and specific. You know, it takes time to engineer the first robots. Once you know exactly how to program them and how to produce them, this is the kind of good which becomes cheap to produce. But it's always a huge cost to come up with the robot that will that is going to perform the task you need kind of like vaccines coming up with the vaccine is very expensive replicating vaccines once you have one is super easy it is typically a sector where we have economies of scale making the first vaccine costs millions of dollars in terms of research maybe billions making the second vaccine doesn't cost much the second vaccine costs I don't know, how much does it cost to make a vaccine? Two dollars? I don't even know. Literally just buy the needle, which is probably very cheap to make, and put the liquid in it. So the marginal cost is very cheap, it's very low. So the more you produce, the more the average cost will decrease. Internal economies of scale. Same with the computer chip. Same with any good that comes from innovation, pretty much. Coming up with the first product that works, out of this research and development process is very expensive because so far all the money spent was the money spent in research and development. If you produce one extra unit, that becomes very cheap because we already have the know-how. Robots are becoming cheaper and more versatile, leading to a more widespread use and a lower need for um, some particular types of labor. In the chat, um, somebody's talking about the movie Vice with Christian Bale again. Very good. I like Vice as well. You should watch Vice too. Same director, same actor. Last point about the issues related to production, 3D printing. Fewer pieces are needed to be assembled thanks to 3D printing and other technologies, which, decrease, uh, which decreases trade in intermediate products. If you need intermediate parts for your car, like specific parts for the door, the glass, and so on, some of them can be already assembled using 3D printing rather than asking different factories to produce them and assemble them. In fact, you can even make guns with 3D printing nowadays, with something that a consumer could buy, like a 3D printer that some consumers could buy. So. I don't know if those guns work or if they actually you can fire something with them. Uh, I'm guessing not. I'm guessing you can just make replicas. But that could be an interesting way to um, to maybe replace some of the guns in the US, some of the real guns, to still deter um, to still deter bad behaviors. Even having a fake gun, some people might not want to take the risk of uh, trespassing to your property if they see a gun. It could be a fake one, a real one. If it's a real one, that's gonna be bad. So maybe just having a fake one could be enough to deter such behaviors. Technological changes are making the supply chains shorter, less production stages, and less reliant on low-skilled labor. Interestingly, it also makes the distribution chains shorter. If now you want to get a good, you pretty much need only one intermediary. 
let's say you want to get something, go to Amazon, and Amazon is directly buying from the producer. If you want to get a book, same thing. Back in the days, you would have to go to, like, let's say a Safeway. Safeway who's buying from a bigger store, like a Costco type store. This, co this Costco type store is buying from the direct producer. And if you think about things like meat, um, horse meat in particular, that sounds like random, but horse meat used to have seven steps, seven different steps in the supply chain. You would have um, the farmer who, you know, who breeds um, the horses. Then it would sell, there will be a person who negotiates buying the horses. So just strictly just buying them at the best price. Then he would resell them to some sort of a butcher or maybe a distribution center. Then they would sell them to the retail butcher and then to the, to the consumer. Nowadays, distribution chains are way shorter. You can go online and, direct, and purchase directly from the producer most of the time. So they are also decreasing the, the share and the role of international trade for manufacturing products. Interestingly, there has been a decrease in intermediaries in supply chains and um, distribution chains, but there has been an increase in intermediaries in um, sectors that require very specific knowledge. Think about consulting. Consulting was not a big thing 20 years ago. Firms were doing a lot of their own um, audits, performance assessments, and so on, uh, by either asking another firm or by doing it internally. Now they go to another firm who has different sorts of specialists that are going to do it for them. You also have issues related to demand that might either deepen or slow down the second and bundling. Environmental protection and constraints um, can favor quality and long-lasting products at the expense of cheap and dirty products. We have more and more um, sanitary norms about how products are being made, in which conditions and where. There have been more and more environmental um, regulations that are going to favor quality and long-lasting products. Customization of products as well. It is increasingly easier and cheaper to produce any good specifically to each consumer's taste. Of course, I'm not talking about you getting your tailored iPhone, but I'm talking about getting maybe an iPhone with a specific design. And many designs can be proposed, although the hardware inside of the iPhone, iPhone is still the same. Economies of scale still exist, but it is less necessary to produce the same products over and over to exploit them. Think about a phone, for instance. You can just change um, the case or a couple things here and there, and you can still benefit from economies of scale. With customization, it is more important to be near the consumers. So there is uh, a trend, a tendency to maybe relocate, to maybe rebundle production and consumption for um, these types of goods. Technology makes it possible to rebundle production and consumption. What about planned product obsolescence? Have you heard of this? I think most of you have by now. This is not that recent anymore. Uh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a rather recent uh, phenomenon. Um, I remember I heard about it the first time with the, um, the increase in um, personal printers at home. So you would buy a printer that maybe uh, also is a scanner for your own, uh, for your computer. So a lot of people, I remember at least around my hometown, would have a printer. They would change ink every now and then. It would be relatively expensive, but you can print a lot of things with it. But after six months or a year, your printer would start to, um, to fuck up. 
one uh, one copy out of two would be like weird, like it would be like the paper would be jammed or the ink would not print correctly or there would be problems like this. This is called planned obsolescence. Because those goods are durable, if you buy a printer, you should expect to at least use it for five years or at least back in the days. Producers know that once you get a printer, you won't come back to the store for a while. So in order to make you come back, they make their product non-durable. They planned, they plan its obsolescence. Um, among other devices, they use chips that they put behind the printer, back then at least. Now I think it's illegal, at least in Europe, I believe it's illegal. Um, this chip would pretty much make the printer fuck up or break down after let's say 1000 copies being printed. So it's planned to break eventually. So that you're like, oh, the printer doesn't work anymore. I'm gonna buy a new one. Same with phones. Many phones are um, have planned obsolescence. There was the case for um, some batteries. So maybe not for the new iPhones, I'm not sure. I'm not an iPhone guy, but back in iPhone 3, 4 and so on, your battery would have to be charged, let's say every day at the beginning. And this moved onto charge every hour or charge every half day. So the battery would naturally decay faster than, um, than the producers um, can make it last pretty much. So there are different reasons, of course. One of the reason is as you update your system and you get new apps, it is more demanding in resources. So your battery automatically is going to spend more resources just to run the more recent apps. But there was also some hardware inside the phones that would make the phone not durable. Now it's less obvious. They don't use obvious uh, chips or uh, hardware um, like that. What they use, however, is updates. After one or two years using your phone, they say, oh, you have to update your, your um, operating system. And once you do it, they say, your phone is too old. You, can update, you cannot update your OS in three months or in one month. You won't be able to text anymore. You won't be able to use Messenger anymore. You won't be able to use WhatsApp anymore. And this is how they get you to buy a new one. So, plan obsolescence is becoming less acceptable because consumers also being aware, they are getting aware that producers, especially of, of technology, can make their stuff last longer. They can make it last longer. They choose not to, to make you go back to the store. See the controversy about Apple and its battery life, also about the regular introduction of new models. So plant obsolescence is useful to add additional demand for a product in a saturated market. Think even about, I can think about microwaves. It's, it's, it sounds silly, but um, back home, we changed microwave. My, my parents changed the microwave maybe uh, in 2000, what, 2005 or something like that. It's a microwave we got from, I believe, my grandmother who died in 2001. Yes. And she had that microwave for easily 15 years as well. So of course the microwave doesn't have many functionalities, but the maximum power, the maximum heat you could put in microwave was still high enough to heat up everything you needed. Now you change microwaves every what, four or five years? Yet technology is better. So if you buy a simple, a simple microwave, how come it doesn't last as long as it used to? Higher product quality and durability might affect how and where production takes place. If you need to produce less goods because people don't come back to buy them, then you will have a smaller scale of production. So it might not be that profitable to produce all those parts in different countries to benefit from economies of scale.
Overall, consumers demand for higher quality and more durable products that are specific to their individual tastes may also contribute to affect the second unbundling. So to conclude about this first force, the direction of globalization is uncertain. We have technological changes that make unbundling increasingly cheaper, but increasingly unnecessary. Less need for workers abroad. We have political forces that make countries increasingly nationalist for some protectionist. So we have to be careful about that. We have consumers who are being increasingly torn between buying more and cheaper products and their impact on the environment. More and more people, although it's a small number, are willing to pay a higher price for a good if it means a higher production quality, in the sense um, an environmentally friendly production process, or better working conditions for workers, for the workers that produced the good. Likely, the outcome of all this is a wider distribution of different strategies adopted by firms and sectors regarding where to produce, how to produce, and what to produce. That might be a problem for emerging and developing countries, which are the countries usually that developed countries turn to, in particular for cheap labor. If cheap labor is not that necessary anymore due to um, technology, political forces and so on, then those countries might um, lose appeal and they might have a harder time to develop. Let's talk about the third unbundling now. So, first unbundling, lower transportation costs due to the steam revolution and liberalization of trade. Second unbundling, decrease in communication costs due to the ICT revolution. Gilder's law, Moore's law, Metcalf's law show you how fast communication and information technologies are um, innovating and progressing. Third and bundling is about face-to-face -face, face -to -face costs. In the second and bundling, communication is easier, but face-to-face -face is still necessary. So you can send one of your engineers to another country, and this engineer is going to show them how things are done, is going to transmit the know-how. What if the face-to-face -face constraint is relaxed by technology? And this is where uh, we are headed right now. Telepresence makes widely separated conference facilities look like everyone is in the same room. You can take a look at this picture here, where we have um, three screens at the end of a table, and it makes the table round, and it looks like those four people on these uh, three screens are actually sitting on the same table. That's uh, this one in particular is Cisco's telepresence technology. Zoom related software fulfill the same purpose. Where do you think I am right now? Okay, I'm in the office <laughs> on a beach, yeah, with my green screen, but technically. I could be at home in France at my parents' place, not pay tuition, uh, not pay tuition, not pay rent for the whole semester, and be in my bedroom with my green screen teaching you guys Econ 102. I could be doing that. Nobody would be, um, nobody would be, would be affected due to the nature of the course right now because it's remote. The university is planning back, is planning to go back to uh, in-person teaching. So definitely, then face-to-face -face costs will, uh, the face-to-face -face constraints will be back. But teaching might also head towards a um, remote setting. 
I would not be surprised if some universities propose uh, the same course taught by two different professors, where one of them is in person and the other one is a remote um, is a remote version. The same content could be taught, but they could get more attendance by attracting all of those people who want to study from abroad. Why not? That would be a good thing for universities if they want to keep uh, milking those international students' tuition fees. I'm not going to suggest that to my department, but I would not be surprised if they decided to do it. So Cisco's telepresence makes widely separated conference facilities look like everyone is in the same room. There is also holographic telepresence. It projects real-time, three-dimensional images of people. I mean, I think all of you guys have watched some sci-fi movies by now. In every, every one of them, there is, at some point, some holograms. In fact, holograms was used by one candidate in the presidential election in France in 2017. You can click on this link to see how this looked like. Jean-Luc Mélenchon is the, um, how can I best describe him? He's a lunchbox. Um, I mean, they're all the lunchbox, I suppose. Um, he, he represents the closest thing there is to the communist party in France, but he's not, he's not a communist anymore. There is no such thing as a communist party in France anymore, or at least not that big. Um, right now, his party is called um, La France Insoumise, which is like non non surrendering France. So he's trying to rile up the young in particular and, and try to uh, rile up this population and fight against the left and the right, against the big parties. Um, but he is extremely, his ego is, is extremely big. So you can see online. Probably you won't find subtitles in English, but you can find online um, some meetings where, you know, he's trying to be with the population because he's trying to be a man of the people. But at some point, somebody is touching him and he says, don't touch me. My person is sacred because he is a uh, deputy. He represents, he's part of the parliament. And he says, my person is sacred. It's like, yeah, this kind of guy. So he's the kind of guy who uh, talks about revolution. He talks about the Sixth Republic, so he wants to uh, start, start a new republic, so I guess he wants to change the constitution. But at the same time, uh, this guy accumulates two or three positions. We are pretty much sure that he's paid between 20 and 30 thousand dollars a month, thousand euros a month, and that uh, he doesn't have to pay for his apartment. He doesn't have to pay for the driver, I believe, and he doesn't have to pay for most of his lunches. So, you know, it's hard to believe that such a guy is leading a revolution when he's been rich since the 70s or the 80s. Anyway, he's been on the political landscape for a while, so you can guess how rich this guy is. I saw him in real life, though, uh, making a speech for the 2012 election. Uh, pretty charismatic. That, I have to say, is pretty good. Any thoughts on Marine Le Pen? Not really. Um, she's doing her thing. She might get to the second round again. Who knows? But everybody's against her every time. I think people demonize her, demonize her more than uh, than she actually is. But I don't think she's great either. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think she's as bad as uh, all other politicians um, make her to be. But that's for another time. So Cisco Company produces telepresence systems that combine full-sized images of participants using plasma screens, like the three screens you saw on the previous picture. So Cisco provides you the whole uh, package. You can actually check it online. It's pretty expensive, but I guess big consulting firms probably have the money to invest in at least one of these, um, um, one of these packages and have a meeting room this way. Sound channels, high-precision microphones, um, super good bandwidth, and so on. So the idea is to reproduce a boardroom. 
The quality video is here to be able to read faces. Do you need to read my face right now? Not sure you do. My camera is not super HD. It's okay HD. It's basic HD. I might buy a, a better one later, but when it comes to work and having meetings with business partners, definitely um, reading faces becomes important. Have you ever heard of the TV show Lie to Me? With, um, what's his name? Roth. Which one? Eric Roth? Ellie Roth? I don't remember. One of the guys who is in um, Reservoir Dogs by uh, Quentin Tarantino. So, psychology research shows that microexpressions, split-second facial changes, and so on, can indicate whether a person is concealing an emotion or whether it's conscious or unconscious. So if you watch this TV show, every now and then they give you a couple bites of how to see when somebody's lying. I don't know how much of it is true, how much of it is um, statistically backed up, but things such as if you ask a question uh, to someone and this person is looking to the far left, like up, um, to the top right hand corner or right or top left hand corner, I forgot, this person is uh, lying. Like, yeah, it could be conscious or unconscious. If this person is going, is looking at uh, the bottom left, then it means something else. So there are some, there are some um, behavioral, um, behavioral traits that you can notice, and that might say something about whether somebody is lying, somebody is telling you bullshit, and so on and so forth. Even a position of arms in a meeting is saying something about the mindset. For instance, when people are crossing their arms, typically they are uh, in their serious mode. More like, I'm listening, like with attention, and I'm ready to jump at you if you're saying bullshit. Like, careful, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. Whereas maybe uh, if you have a different posture, maybe like a more relaxed posture, you might be prone to um, let some mistakes or let some bullshit slip. So, Skype, uh, would not allow you to um, read faces enough because Skype's quality is not great. Zoom's quality is actually pretty good. Um, but um, yeah, in general, you will need higher, um, higher definition cameras if you want to read faces. So this, uh, these nonverbal messages are uh, pretty much one of the features that are going to limit the a third and bundling, which are going to keep face-to-face -face constraints pretty binding, in particular when it comes to business meetings. You will always get a better impression of uh, a potential business partner over lunch, over other events, over other over face-to-face -face events. That's also why a lot of business people play golf together. They have lunch together and so on. Sounds like a cool life, but apparently a lot of people who work in the field actually get tired of business meetings and stuff because lunch becomes work. You have to be careful about the way you behave, the way you hold yourself and so on, because there could be a contract at the end of it. Same when it comes to golfing or whatever. That sounds like fun because you're in California, you're just spending the afternoon golfing with a potential business partner. I don't know if I would like that. I'm okay with golfing every now and then, but... I don't think this is the thing I would prefer to do the most. Especially thinking, oh, I have to be careful about the way I hold myself. Maybe I have to look good at golfing, where I suck. But maybe I have to look good, or maybe I have to look not good, depending on whether I want to satisfy um, my business partner's ego or not. That's also another... All of those things are ways to get contracts signed. Yeah, networking, exactly. Here are, here are a couple of collaborative uh, platforms. So there is this one called Skype for Business that inclu includes more uh, functionalities online, but the principle is the same. It's pretty much a Zoom. Um, Slack, Trello, Basecamp. So I look at them quickly and they're in blue because you can click on them. I use Trello personally, it's, a, it's free. Uh, at least the free functionalities are pretty good. It's a way to build collaborative projects online. So 
on Trello. I can build uh, kind of flashcards or sticky notes on the screen. I can make different sections. And then I can invite people to participate to that project. So for instance, there is a course I teach with somebody else. It's another course, Econ 220W, where we are two teachers teaching the course. We each teach a different uh, content. So we use Trello to uh, check whether week after week we are up to date. So we're going to have week one, lecture one, tutorial one. And, you know, we're going to, I'm going to have a label, which is red as in has to be done or orange as in partially done or green as in done. And then you can just interact on that platform to see how, um, how the project is evolving. Discord is another one initially used mostly for gamers. I mean, you guys have a net have a discord, so you know exactly, um, uh, what's going on with it. But I know that my secretaries here in my department are also on a discord server because they all work from home. So they use discord to talk to each other about, uh, different deadlines and so on. Okay. Before I get into telerobotics, let's have a break. It's 11.45. Let's have a break until Oh, Microsoft Mesh. Okay. Thanks for the tip.
Guys, can you hear this? Fuck. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go. <laughs> the 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 exit is right there. I'm gonna go out for two minutes, three minutes, and I'm gonna wait a bit. And if wait for me to come back. If the alarm is still on, I'll come back and at least I'll say let's finish the lecture here. I don't have a lot more to say anyway, so I'll go out. But please stay here. The break is gonna be a bit longer. That's all.
Ah! Okay, fuck this. No, the alarm is still on. How much is there to cover? Six lights? Oh yeah. Is the is the alarm a big issue right now? Because I can go through the six lights pretty quickly or I can let you um, maybe finish them, but yeah, you guys okay? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I'll be fast. Ah, oh, shit. No, but I'm, I'm two doors away from the outside. Like, I can literally leave right now. Um, I'm right there. No, it's all good. Okay, Cisco. Yeah, Cisco is good. Oh, yeah. Tele robotics And remote intelligence. Yeah, I don't know if I should do it. Yeah, okay, let's this slide and then and then done and I'll finish next week. Okay, okay, so Robots right you can control uh, you can control robots from a distance so they can move look around at the command of the remote person Think about long-distance surgery. So this is a link that will get you to um, Will get you to uh, a story about doing surgery from a distance in Canada but you can also do warfare. So you know that drones these days are used by the army to drop bombs on uh, populations. I mean, it's not supposed to be populations, but it tends to it happens to be populations in the Middle East. And all of that is just a couple of buttons being pressed by um, by an American army man in the U.S. in the U in the U.S. army based. So yeah, that's. It comes with its pros and its cons. And in fact, remember that many innovations um, were created, were made with the purpose of conducting warfare in the first place. Many innovations were found by the army in order to produce violence first before producing civil um, improvings, uh, before improving the life of civilians. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because if this is on YouTube. I. It's gonna be a problem for me as well uh, to be just teaching under the alarm. Sorry about that, guys. The rest is rather straightforward, but I'll talk about it next week anyway. Next week, next week is gonna be the last lecture of in terms of content. The week after that, we'll have the quiz and I will cover a whole review of the course. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.